Good day, everybody. Uh, my name is Yasin Mullah, and today we'll be discussing the use of multimodal biometrics from the cradle to the grave. So first of all, what are biometrics? They are traits of an individual which can be measured and then used for identification. Multimodal biometrics then is the use of multiple biometrics to uh, measure an individual and use them for identification. And we can then take this a step further towards multi-factor authentication. In that case, we have biometrics, which are who you are, which then can be combined with either a smart card, which is something you have, or with a password, which is something that you know. And by combining these all together, we can then create high security access control systems. So the aim of our project is to use biometrics such as the ear, the iris, the fingerprint, and the face, and combine these with uh, things like smart cards to create multi multimodal, multi-factor authentication systems. And in that way, we will also focus from the use of biometrics right from infancy through adulthood and beyond, and create systems that are usable in a, and relevant in a South African context. So as an overview, uh, we have, uh, as I mentioned, the four types of biometrics that we are mostly focusing on are the iris, the face, the ear, and the fingerprint. The iris, the ear, and the fingerprint can be used for both infants and adults, and the faces for adults. So we look at the entire range of ages. We also develop hardware such as the infant fingerprint scanner and optical coherence tomography for fingerprint acquisition. And we, to support this all, we also use smart tokens such as the smart, uh, the Na South African national smart ID cards. In all of this, we then create multimodal, multi-factor authentication systems. So uh, we will start off with a discussion on the use of biometrics for infants and then move on to adulthood and beyond. So this is uh, our biometrics team, and so I will be talking on behalf of the entire team today. We'll start off with infant biometrics. So why are we focusing on infant biometrics? The mandate of the CSIR is to do research and technological innovation to improve the quality of the lives of the people of South Africa. And a current challenge that affects South Africa and the world is that there's currently no way to acquire the biometrics from infants at birth and persistently match them as the children grow up into adulthood. So this is a challenge that is still open and something that we are addressing. Why is this important as well? So there are many reasons why being able to recognize children is important. For example, in South Africa, we need to register and get a, an ID card before we can write our, our matric exams. And sometimes a person might discover that somebody has already taken the ID number and registered it and created a false identity. And then now the student has to prove that they are who they are and before they can get the ID and write the exam. Uh, another example, so nurses are human. Sometimes they might make mistakes and uh, mix children up in a hospital and the wrong parents go home with the wrong babies. So uh, by, if we are able to register the children right at birth, it reduces the risk of uh, children being accidentally swapped. And then we also can look at uh, uh, challenges such as fraud. So for example, in one country alone, in one year, the total cost of child-related identity fraud was 2.6 billion US dollars. Now imagine how much it is if you expand this to all the countries around the world. So if we can acquire biometrics from children right at birth, we can create legal identities for them to civil registration and civil identification that stretches right from birth to death. This can address issues such as identity theft and identity fraud. It can also uh, be used in border management and uh, scenarios and to prevent uh, child trafficking at borders. It can also be used in administrative scenarios such as healthcare and health management systems and education systems and social service management systems. And another scenario is also for the use of uh, identifying lost children. For example, if a child is really young, they might not be able to speak, or they might not know what their parents' names are or the address, but if there's a database which uh, rec has records of the children's biometrics, it then is easier to find out who, where they stay and who their parents are and reunite them with their parents if they are lost. Now the question is, so how do we address this? Well, we need to acquire the biometrics from birth, 
and then consistently match these biometrics as the children grow up into adulthood. And then the question is, which modality do we use? So the thing is that different modalities work better in different scenarios. So it's better to assess a wide range of biometrics and create multimodal systems. So we did an assessment of uh, various biometrics. The ones that worked out best were the fingerprint, the iris, and the ear. And we did a wide range of assessments, such as uh, universality, which means uh, does everybody have this biometric? If, then is it unique per individual? And is it permanent over a long collection of long period of time? Is it collect, how easy is it to collect it? Uh, people find it acceptable for the biometric to be collected? And then how well does it perform? And can people fake the biometric as well? So the best performances were for the fingerprint and the iris. The ear is a new biometric, so there's still some research that needs to be done, but it's very promising. But there are still some questions on how unique it is, to what extent. We looked at the face, of course, faces change a lot in the first few months of a child's life. So they're not very permanent in that case. And it's the same thing with the voice. Babies can't speak, so we cannot use them for infants. Palm prints are similar to fingerprints in the information that they provide. However, they are much a palm print is much larger than a fingerprint. And for that reason, it requires bigger cameras and becomes more costly. And then if we consider footprints, they are also similar to palm prints, but then there's also the issues of acceptability once people start wearing shoes and if they have to put their feet on the same scan that other people put their feet. So that is uh, not a very viable solution in the long term. And then we considered finger veins and palm veins as well, but there's a challenge in collecting, uh, finding devices to collect that data from infants. So our focus is on the fingerprint, the iris, and the ear. So I will now talk on what are the performances of these three modalities. So here we have uh, the fingerprint of a 10-week-old child. On the right, we have a fingerprint, the fingerprint word that which was collected using a conventional scanner. As you can see, it's just a blob. You really cannot see much information in that fingerprint. However, we then developed a acquisition device to collect this information from the, thing, from the children. And with the same child, once we collect the fingerprint using the device we collected, which is shown on the left, you can then see the details quite clearly. You can see the ridges and the valleys and where the ridges split and where they end and use that information to then identify individuals. So with the device that we developed, our equal error rate is at about 15%, which is about 85% accuracy. Uh, this is good, but we want to make it better. So we are working on hardware to increase the acquisition area and improve the focus. And then if we can collect better quality fingerprints, we believe we can actually reduce the error rate and increase the accuracy as well. And we'd like to also collect more data in that case to then test it on a larger number of children. Then we move on to the iris. So the software that we've developed and using commercial off-the-shelf iris scanner, we can acquire irises from adults and children. But the challenge is that when children are very young and they cannot understand human speech yet, it becomes very difficult to tell them, look at the camera, because they cannot understand. Uh, so in that case, it uh, then becomes difficult to acquire the irises. However, in the cases where we can acquire the iris, we've shown that we can match it. So the challenge is how do we improve the acquisition rate for very young children? And this is still a challenge that we are addressing and uh, developing hardware to improve that. Then we move on to the ear. Uh, over here as well, our equal error rate is quite low, and we have tested it on a wide range of children. And we've also shown that uh, over a 16-month period from 8 months to 24 months, the ear is quite persistent and permanent uh, in terms of its shape and uh, patterns. So we can do matching over a wide period of time with the ears as well. So this covers the biometrics for infants. And now I will hand over to my colleague, Norman, who will speak about biometrics for adults. Good day, everybody. Thank you very much, Yasin, for the brief introduction. My name is Norman Nerufule. I will be continuing from where Yasin left off. Basically, I will be talking about biometrics for adults. So the first item of the biometric for adults I'm going to talk about is called veristic print. Actually, veristic print is nothing else but the fingerprint recognition system that is fully customizable based on the client's needs. 
So this is done by using basic smartphone cameras, which are maybe 8 megapixels, that we use as a fingerprint scanners. And by doing that, we also add an extra layer of security by hashing the templates that we produce before matching. So why are we doing this very stick print technology? It is good because it is contactless and it is also non-invasive. So this is very good for hygiene purposes. And currently now that we are faced with the COVID-19 outbreak, it is an ideal biometric for the hospitals and other high hygiene protocols. And it can also be used even in situations where you have unconscious patients in the accident scene. So this is more usable even when you don't know anybody, but you have a fingerprint that you can scan using your mobile devices. The other advantage is that it's also very cheap. So we use the existing digital technologies as the fingerprint scanners. So we don't have to go and introduce more expensive imaging devices in order to build this technology. So the other good thing about this technology is that there is ease of interoperability. So you can just put it in another scanners that you have developed, as long as they are ISO IEC compatible. So you just plug and play with minor integration adjustment based on the requirements of your users. And the biggest advantage that is offering now is the ease of secure online transactions. Currently, during this lockdown, people have been ordering foods and other items. So it makes it much easier to confirm who ordered these packages. Things like the medication, the bank cards, the IDs, even the driver's licenses. So this is a very good technology that we are looking at. So how does it actually work? So actually, when you start, you need to capture the thumb, the surface of the fingerprint using the mobile technology. And then once that image is captured, it has to be processed. Once it processed, you extract the features, and then you hatch the features so that they can be protected. In other words, you encrypt such features. So once they are encrypted, then you can store them into the database. So the same process will be followed even when you do the verification, either or identification. So what are the challenges that we are, we are facing in developing this technology? And the future work also, what we are planning to do. We are currently looking at developing the American National Standard Institute fingerprint standard that can be available as an option during the template generation. And the other thing that we are planning to do is to migrate all the processing from the web services into the embedded systems so that whatever information will be processed it will be happening in the device itself. So the other modality I'll talk about is the face recognition. So the face recognition is the software application that is capable of uniquely identifying or even verifying a person based on their facial landmarks. So it's a matter of comparing and analyzing the patterns in the facial contours and then deciding whether the person is the same person who claims he is or it's a different person. Why are we using this technology? The main advantage is that it's non-invasive. It doesn't pose any harm to the subjects. And there is also ease of implementation. There is a reliability accuracy. And it also enhances security as well. How does it work? Generally, as other modalities, we need to enroll the subject first. And then we store them into the database. So when the subject comes back, for verification or identification. So we capture the image, we extract the features, and then uh, we see if we compare the extracted features with the features that are stored in the database. So once the threshold determines whether the person is the one who claims he is, then that person can be accepted. If the person is not, then that person will be rejected. So in the current system that we developed, we only used the 30 subjects where we collected the 30 images from each subject and we ended up having 900 images and we managed to have 99 percent accuracy so in future we are planning to collect more data set so that we can train with more reliable images from the diverse population that we have in south africa the other advantage that the facial recognition system offers is that it can be combined into a multi-factor authentication with either a smart card or a different biometric. So this is done in a situation where high security is desired. 
and it is done to enhance access control. So what actually happens is there is a biometrics, which is what you possess, and there is also a password that you need to remember. You store it in your own brain or you can write it in a piece of paper, but that is likely to be forgotten. And we also have smart cards. So that is a piece of token that you can keep in your pocket, in your wallet, but if you lose your wallet, that smart card is also lost. So what we are trying to do in this research, we are trying to combine all these three technologies into one that we call multi-factor authentication. So the multi-factor authentication, it comprises of biometrics, password, and smart tokens. So the reason why we are doing this, we want to try to eliminate the vulnerabilities in each technology. So the other area of technology that we are looking at is the national EID framework. So this is the South African EID smart cards where we want to try and unlock the full potential of the national EIDs by utilizing fingerprints technologies. And we are doing this only to improve the service delivery, nothing else. So the other technology that we are interested in is what happens if we have registered the biometrics technology for someone from birth as an adult, now the person is no more. How can we use the, the biometrics technology when the person is no more? So we are looking at the technology called the optical coherence tomography, the OCT. So actually what the OCT is capable of doing is to be able to capture the fingerprint from the subsurface of the fingerprint itself. So what it does, it solves the problems that the normal fingerprint scanners cannot do. For instance, the conventional fingerprint scanners, they can only capture the surface of the fingerprint. Like if you look at the images on the left, that is the output of the conventional fingerprint scanner. The one you normally use when you go to the banks, the one you normally use when you go to the post office and so forth. But if you check at the image itself, it's not clear. There is so many noises on the image. But if you look at the image on the right, you can see that the image is showing all the fingerprint patterns that you need, that you require in order to process the image. And that is the output of the OCT subsurface fingerprints. It's not the surface of the finger, it's the subsurface of the fingerprint. That is the origin where the fingerprint originates. So what the OCT does, it actually uses the optical technique with a low powered light source to capture data from below the screen. And it can also capture the cross-sectional images of semi-transparent material. And the good thing about this technology is that it's very safe and it has also been used by ophthalmologists in the eye examinations. So we are not only concentrating on what others have done, but we want to apply this technology into a different direction. So we are currently using it into fingerprint matching so that we can enhance the biometric security authentication using fingerprints and this OCT technology. This is the first OCT machine that we were using. But if you look at the picture itself, you can see that the machine is big, very difficult to carry, and impossible to make it mobile. So what it does, if you check in the image that shows the finger on the right, it's showing the line, which is the red line. That red line is showing the point where the light source is penetrating the skin in order to access the content of the subsurface of that fingerprint. So what it does, from the clip that you see, it's showing the 3D image of the subsurface, which shows the upper surface, which is the surface of the fingerprint that we see with our naked eyes. And inside, it goes and it penetrates and look at the deeper subsurface fingerprints. That is the one we are going to use. The current challenge that we are having now is this technology that we were using, it's difficult to make it mobile. So if you want to carry it to an environment where maybe the accidents occurs, you want to take pictures of the residues, it's very difficult to, to use that kind of technology. So what we did now, we developed a lesser, heavier technology, which is the blue, which has the arm. So you can move the arm to different directions but it also has some limitations because you can't take it to any directions. So you still have some limitations. 
But what we are working on now is to make sure that we have a more mobile technology using the OCT technology that is embedded in this technology that we can be able to use to carry into different locations. The main thing that this technology can do, especially when we detect the subsurface, if you look at the picture, you can see that the white line on top is showing the subsurface, the surface of the fingerprint itself. That is the part that you see when you look at the fingerprint. So the red line that you see is the subsurface of the fingerprint that can be detected only by the OCT machines. So only the OCT machine can detect the subsurface. The conventional fingerprint scanners cannot detect that red line. So the advantages, like I've mentioned, is the ability to detect the fingerprint attacks, and it also offers the capability to capture high-quality contactless fingerprints and is less affected by cuts damages, scars, eczema, and is useful for access control, especially for artisans who works in the mines, they have oils in their hands, and so forth. And uh, the good thing is it's contactless, no distortion, not affected by finger pressure, oils, dirt, and all these kind of things. And it's also hygiene. So in case where you have eczema, the image on the left is showing the picture that was captured using the conventional scanners. So you capture the unnecessary information that you don't want to use, making it more difficult to process that image. So it will be costly in terms of processing time. But if you look at the image on the right, that is the output of the OCT image. That is the subsurface. So the surface, if it's damaged, it doesn't affect the internal part. So the good thing about this OCT, it can capture the region that cannot be damaged by external problems. So this is the image that I've shown previously, that the OCT can solve problems that the conventional scanners currently cannot solve. So the other good thing about OCT, they are good in detecting spoofs. So if you look at the picture, you can see that the conventional scanners that we use currently they cannot detect the fake fingerprint. So on top, we have a normal finger, but it has a plastic on top of the fingerprint that we need to capture. If you look at the captured on the top right, there are three images that have been captured using the conventional scanner. So the conventional scanner cannot detect that there is plastic there. So if we take a rubber finger, and then we try to scan on the conventional scanners, it can still scan. It doesn't know whether there is a rubber or this is a plastic finger, so it doesn't detect that. So this is one of the examples of the successful attacks against the conventional scanners. But if you are using OCT using the same images, the OCT will just stop because it can detect that there is no subsurface here. So actually it, can, it must detect the surface of the finger and then it must penetrate deep into the skin. So if it fails to detect the skin itself, it just stops. That is why you cannot see the white line and the red line that I have shown in the previous slide. So the other good thing about this technology is that we are able to uplift the residues that are left in the crime scenes. So this is very applicable in the forensic investigations. So if you leave your fingerprints at the door, on the cell phone, or other items that you have touched, this technology is able to uplift those fingerprints and use them to identify or to trace who this person might be. So it's non-destructive, and it can be used on various surfaces, glass, metals, and so forth. Our ultimate goal in this research is to make sure that if we manage to collect the biometrics as at birth, we should be able to use the same technology, even during the adulthood, and even when the person is no more, we should be able to use the same technology. That is our ultimate goal. Thank you very much. We are open for questions and discussions.